a full house tonight. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Arkan Fung, and I'm the acting dean of the Harvard Kennedy School. It's my great pleasure tonight <coughs> to welcome you to this evening's discussion on behalf of the Kennedy School and the Institute of Politics. Thanks to Topwa Agabalungun <laughs> and the Black Men's Forum for putting this event together. We're happy tonight to be partnering with the Black Men's Forum, as well as the Harvard Black Students Association and the Association of Harvard Black Women to co-host this event. This is a critical question tonight that we're addressing, the future of progressive politics in America, because the, what the wor left worries about in the US are problems that are very much with us today. Three of those problems are peace, social justice, and economic equality. My oldest son, Alexander, is 12 years old, and for his whole life, the United States has been at war, but living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you wouldn't really know it. A second historical concern of the left is social justice. The challenges of social justice are legion in the United States, and it, perhaps these days it comes out most clearly on the dimension of race. It's a perceptual problem and an epistemic problem in part. Differences in the ways that black Americans and white Americans and uh, minorities perceive the reality of everyday life. And this is one reason uh, that Ta-Nehisi Coates' book has been such a blockbuster success because it's helped elucidate that reality for many of us. He will be coming to the forum uh, later on this fall. It's also uh, reflected in the problem of mass incarceration. As many of you know, the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. In 2000, one in 10 black males between the ages of 10 and 20 was incarcerated to 10 times the rate of their white peers. The chances of a black man under 35 who's a high school dropout being involved in the prison system, in the criminal justice system, is 70%, 70%. Right now, there are 1.2 million black children with a parent who's incarcerated. That's one in nine. A third traditional concern of the American left has been economic inequality. Inequality in the United States, as you know, has been on the rise for decades. And now people in the top 1% of the income distribution in the United States receive more than 20% uh, of all the pre-tax income, while the bottom 90% that is, nine-tenths of the population, receives less than one-half of the income in the United States. And all three of these problems threaten American democracy in a fundamental way. And that's why I'm delighted to have our two guests here tonight in the forum to help address this uh, problem and some of its, these set of problems and their political solutions. The first is Brandon Terry, a distinguished member of the Harvard faculty in the government department in African American studies, whom uh, Justin will say a bit more about in a moment. I wanted to take uh, just a few uh, minutes to talk about Noam Chomsky. I've known Noam since 1988, when I was an undergraduate at MIT. And I asked him with a friend of mine to uh, spend an hour with us every week reading books. And he said yes. And I didn't realize then how much of an improbable event that was, or indeed how much of a, of a privilege. I knew that it was a pleasure then. Um, it, it is certainly the case, or at least very likely the case, that it were, were not for those hours discussing political economy, foreign policy, and the ways that people ought to govern themselves in society, I would be a computer scientist or an engineer right now, rather than a social scientist. Um, one, he's put to us over his career many, many questions. One question that he's continued to put to us since his 1967 essay on the responsibility of intellectuals is, what should intellectuals do in society? He put it this way in a reprise of that essay in 2011 in the Boston Review. And he says, the question that resonates through the ages in one form or another today offers a framework for determining the responsibility of intellectuals. The phrase is ambiguous. Pay attention to this part. First, does it refer to intellectuals' moral responsibilities as a decent human beings in a position to use their privilege and status to advance the causes of freedom, justice, mercy, and peace, and other such concerns? That's one possibility. The second possibility is, does it refer to the role they are expected to play in serving, not derogating, leadership and established institutions? So intellectuals can call out power, or they can <coughs> serve established institutions of power, on the other hand. Those are the two possibilities that Noam 
puts out. Now, these two possibilities put the Harvard Kennedy School in a peculiar position. Many of us as staff, faculty, students, and alumni seek to be intellectually honest and critical even as we try to harness the forces of political, social, and economic power to address fundamental concerns such as peace, social justice, and economic equality. I don't know what the resolution is. However, I do know that I am deeply grateful now, as ever, to Professor Chomsky for at once inspiring many of us to carry on in this work through the power of his own intellect and ex his example, but also for constantly reminding us how challenging that task is. That is to fulfill the social responsibility of intellectuals. Now I'd like to hand the stage over to Justin Porter, who hails from Murray High School in Jackson, Mississippi. I like people coming to Harvard from the South. I grew up in Oklahoma myself. He's currently a Harvard College junior, and we owe him deep thanks for uh, uh, co-organizing this event. Justin, where are you? Justin Porter, thank you very much. This is a dream come true. Uh, <laughs> Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Justin Porter, and I am the Political Action Director of the Harvard Black Men's Forum. Our organization places a premium on thinking critically and rigorously about the future of progressivism. And part of this is a, a matter of identity, um, recognizing the different ways that various groups are marginalized and working to reduce these with disparities both in policy and in everyday interactions. We hope that this is only one of many future collaborations we'll be having with the ILP this year. Um, and with that being said, on behalf of our entire board, I want to introduce our incredible moderator, Professor Brandon Terry. Brandon Terry is Assistant at Professor of African and African American Studies and Social Studies at Harvard University. His current research project sits at the intersection of political theory, history, and African American studies. Our esteemed guest, Noam Chomsky, uh, no introduction needed, but <laughs> is Professor Emeritus of Linguistics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he has taught all of his career. He is credited with the creation of the theory of generative grammar, considered to be one of the most significant contributions to the field of theoretical linguistics in the entire 20th century. Professor Chomsky is also known as a radical political activist who has been one of the most active and most famous American intellectuals of the left since the 60s. He is internationally renowned for his vast writings, presentations, and other broadly published work criticizing imperialism, the United States foreign policy, as well as the role of media in Western democratic societies. We are enormously thankful to have him here sharing words with us this evening. And with that, I want to hand it off to Professor Terry. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you, Justin. Uh, I also want to thank Dean Fung, the Institute of Politics and the Harvard Kennedy School for hosting us this evening. The IOP Forum continues to be one of the best spaces here at Harvard for critical debate and dialogue concerning issues of extraordinary political importance, and I'm happy to be back. Um, I also want to thank the Harvard Black Men's Forum, the Association of Black Harvard Women, and the other African American student groups here on campus. Uh, when major magazines and newspapers decry the coddling of the American mind or the lack of seriousness and rigor that characterizes intellectual life among college students today, it's always heartening to me that the black student groups here are among the folks giving lie to such judgment. So I think they should be uh, applauded for what they've been able to put together today and in inviting the great, great, great Noam Chomsky. After all, it is difficult to think of an intellectual for whom the words serious, seriousness and rigor are more aptly applied. It's an honor to be here with you this evening. Thank you. Um, we're starting a little bit late, so I want to jump right into the conversation. I'll just say we're going to open up for questions soon. And questions have rules here, OK? You've got to introduce yourself. They should be short so that other people can ask questions. And the questions end with a question mark, all right? We don't need your manifesto right now, okay? You can send that by email to Professor Chomsky, all right? Now, I also want to begin with Dean Fung in 1967. That year, you wrote The Responsibility of the Intellectuals, which is, among other things, a blistering critique 
of intellectual apologist for the Vietnam War. You famously wrote that it's the responsibility of intellectuals to speak the truth and expose lies. Intellectuals, you argued, are in a position to expose the lies of government, to analyze actions according to their causes and motives and often hidden intentions. In the Western world, at least, they have the power that comes from political liberty, from access to information and freedom of expression. For a privileged minority, Western democracy provides the leisure, the facilities, and the training to seek the truth lying hidden behind the veil of distortion and misrepresentation, ideology, and class interest through which the events of current history are presented to us. So firstly, I want to ask if this remains your vision of the vocation of intellectuals. And if so, given our topic, power, identity, and the left, I want to ask what are the truths about racial injustice in America most in need of telling in the wake of Ferguson in Baltimore? Well, just as a point of uh, historical accuracy, that article was in fact a talk given to a Harvard student group. Oh, wow. And you, you, would, you won't guess what group it was. The Harvard Hillel Foundation in 1966. Uh, the world has changed. <laughs> it was then picked up and published. Uh, yeah, the vision, I think, remains the same. It's not mine. It goes back to the uh, origin of intellectual history. Uh, actually, the term intellectual wasn't used in the contemporary sense until the late 19th century. It began pretty much with the Dreyfus stories. But you can trace it back. There were people who we call in. We don't call them intellectuals, but they played the same role. You can go back to uh, uh, the person who was uh, who had to drink the hemlock because he was corrupting the youth of Athens by asking too many questions. Uh, the biblical prophets who were driven into the desert, imprisoned, uh, maligned, hundreds of years later honored. Uh, at the same time, the pattern was set, which has persisted through the ages. Uh, the people who maybe in retrospect you honor and respect are typically marginalized, punished, tortured, depending on the nature of the society. Uh, those who are the flatterers of the court are honored, uh, revered, uh, given all sorts of amenities and uh, grants these days and so on. <laughs> and that runs virtually through history, there's very few exceptions. In the case of the Dreyfus Ards, uh, uh, we now honor Emil Zola and the Dreyfus Ards, but they were bitterly attacked by the respected intellectuals of the day. Uh, how dare these uh, writers and uh, poets uh, dare to criticize the uh, magnificent uh, French uh, army and state and so on. Uh, Emil Zola himself had to flee France uh, and uh, it's, uh, there's, there's very rare exceptions to that pattern. But the vision remains the same. The people who we call intellectuals these days, uh, actually the term itself is a very weird one. Uh, so uh, if, uh, uh, say, a, a Nobel Prize uh, physicist is working in his office all day and uh, doing all kind of amazing work in science, but doesn't care much about the world, uh, we don't call him intellectual. Right. If his janitor happens to have great ideas and understanding and uh, deep insight and plenty of knowledge, uh, we don't call him an intellectual. Uh, the people who are called intellectuals are the ones who have enough privilege and authority, deserved or not, uh, so they can, if they choose, uh, articulate their views and who do make the choice to articulate them on matters of public concern. It's a very strange category. It has nothing particular to do with uh, understanding, insight, knowledge, and so right. on. Uh, but uh, these, the vision remains the same, and there are these two options that Archon quoted. Uh, you can use your privilege, uh, your uh, uh, training, your, the freedom that you, uh, that you enjoy for the purpose of uh, improving the world, uh, dealing with problems of suffering people, of injustice, and of war, and so on. Or you can be a flatterer at the court. That's the choice. 
and uh, the overwhelming majority typically choose the latter, all through history. Now, I'm, I'm curious as to, as to, you know, again, so to, to ask this question um, in a slightly different direction. So one is, you know, these truths that need to be told in this era of Baltimore and Ferguson, like how, how might we think about those? And, and, and another thing about the evolution of intellectuals, particularly African-American intellectuals, it seems like we're in a remarkable time uh, where in the history of African-American intellectuals, they've usually been protest intellectuals situated outside of the academy or outside of the halls of privileged power. And now we have a context where, you know, arguably the president himself is an African-American intellectual in some regards or, and is surrounded by, um, <laughs> That's well, this is question. where I'm going. <laughs> and, 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 and that there's a class of African-American intellectuals who've now surrounded in this sense of the court um, to, to work alongside the Obama administration to pursue their ends. And so I'm curious as to, you know, not only speaking to these truths, what are these truths in this moment of Baltimore Ferguson, uh, but also, you know, has something changed for African-American intellectuals? Do they have any specific responsibility given the uh, history and context of the United States? I think the responsibility is always the same. Circumstances change. And so anyway, as to whether something has changed uh, in the lives of African Americans, uh, Ferguson, uh, Baltimore uh, uh, is a kind of a cluster, a statistical clustering of things that go on all the time. I mean, so it's misleading to put them together. This is just constant. I mean, if you take some constant phenomenon, you're going to find little bumps here and there where things cluster, and there happens to be a cluster, but there's nothing new. And in fact, uh, it goes back 400 years. Uh, the first slaves came here in about 1620, roughly. That's 400 years. N very little has changed since, fundamentally. Of course, the nature of the oppression has changed dramatically. So, the, in fact, with all the research that's been done on slavery, it's really only in the last couple of years that new scholarship has brought out uh, understanding and materials uh, both about the character of the slave labor camps, which were incomparably worse than even had been assumed or anything else in history, and also, strikingly, their huge contribution to the uh, modern economic development in the United States, in England, and much of Europe. Uh, it's by now becoming clear, it was kind of somewhat understood, but much more is, come, is uh, becoming understood of the enormous contribution this made to every aspect of the economy for well over a century. Uh, the early Industrial Revolution was based on cotton, that's been known for a long time. But that includes uh, manufacturing, the biggest manufacturing industries, say in Lowell, were textile manufacture, uh, a lot of secondary effects from that. Uh, uh, commerce was heavily based on textiles, cotton production, and so on. The financial institutions developed, uh, first Britain, you know, Barclays Bank, and so on, then here uh, in uh, dealing with uh, uh, the textile industries uh, in England, uh, the manufacturing was the same thing. They were living off of make slave labor camps in the United States for a long time. And these camps were just unbelievable. The new research that's coming out is pretty shocking. So for example, it turns out, this was not known until a couple of years ago, that the productivity in the slave labor camps rose very rapidly, even more rapidly than an industry with no technology, except for the bullwhip and the pistol, just driving people harder and harder, making their lives more and more miserable and impossible. And of course, as you all know, that didn't end with the Civil War. There were a few years of formal freedom when a lot of interesting things happened. Then came the North-South Compact, which simply reinstituted slavery in another form, uh, much like today, in criminalizing black life. Uh, so the black, especially the black male population, straight back to jail uh, for you know, vagrancy or 
whatever it might be, and pretty soon you had a perfect slave labor force. The manufacturers and the mine owners didn't even have to sustain their working for class. The work, like a plantation owner, had to make sure that the slaves ate. But when they're in prison, you don't have to bother with that. The public's doing it. And a good deal of the uh, American Industrial Revolution in the late 19th, early 20th century was based on slave labor in prisons. And we're familiar with the chain gangs because, you know, it's kind of an image. But the same was true of the U.S. Steel uh, mining, a uh, whole huge system. Went up almost up to the Second World War when uh, there was a need for what's called free labor. Actually, I remember as a child, my, my parents had jobs. They were the only ones in the family. They were teachers, so we had you know, small income. But every family who had an income had a maid, and the maid was a black maid until 1939 when they went into the, uh, the manufacturing. So you know, my mother had to learn how to cook. That's her. <laughs> Talked about. And it comes right up to the present. Nothing's changed. This is one of the things we've talked a lot about in my course on um, African American political thought. These these uh, notions of domination. Slavery is a form of domination, and the different practices that are uh, constitutive of that domination, and how they out they have an afterlife from slavery and are reconstituted in so-called free labor and other relations. And some of this great work on uh, slavery and capitalism is being done right here by folks like Sven Beckert and Walter Johnson, yeah. right. Um, so I guess I, you know, there's, um, you know, this this idea of, um, you know, nothing changing, right? That 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 well, that that A lot the, the forms of oppression reconstitute themselves into different iterations of white supremacy, and and <coughs> just as they reconstitute themselves, so do the forms of resistance. And one of the things that's most grabbed the imagination of the public today is the Black Lives Matter movement. And while it's been met with enthusiasm in, in some corners, uh, you know, there's even some concern among fellow travelers on the left that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is evolving in problematic directions. And I was sort of curious as to how you might respond to critics who say that you know, they shouldn't take up tactics like interrupting a uh, presumed sympathizer like Bernie Sanders, or that they focus too narrowly on police brutality instead of a broader social justice agenda, or that emphasizing race, right, this debate about whether black lives matter or all lives matter should be the rhetorical uh, gesture is ultimately divisive. Um, so these all speak to a worry that progressive politics is now unmoored from a kind of leftist foundation and it lacks any clear unifying um, basis. And so I was wondering, given your history and your experience with these enduring debates about race and the left, uh, all the way back to the new left and black power era, how would you respond to these kinds of criticisms about Black Lives Matter? What's your thought about the movement? Well, take, say, all lives matter. I mean, that kind of critique can be made against anything. Uh, suppose you're uh, opposed to the Iraq war or you know, the, uh, the minimum wage. Pick whatever you like. It always generalizes to everything. Why not? Why this, not everything else? And there is something quite unique about black history. I mean, not, actually, it's not totally unique. There's another thing that we don't see very much. But the country was founded, remember, on two major crimes, huge crimes. And the first is it's a settler colonial society. That's a particularly ugly and destructive form of imperialism. It means you don't just rule over the native people, you eliminate them. So they're still around, you know, often corners here and there. But they're situ we, we may not see them every day walking around the streets, but their situation is pretty much like blacks. And that's the second major crime, of course. The two huge crimes of expulsion and extermination and uh, slavery, which, uh, and, uh, which essentially created the economy, uh, they have reverberations right to the present. And that affects the tactics that are used in both groups and gives them a reason to uh, focus on what is a unique form of repression. Uh, that's, uh, uh, you can say the same about, you know, say, uh, uh, Jews under uh, 
Nazi Germany had a good reason to focus on Jewish issues. And uh, uh, with regard to particular tactics, you know, I don't know, you can debate. I think it takes a interrupting Bernie Sanders. I personally didn't like it, but it had a point. And in fact, it ended not badly. It ended with a uh, discussion, debate, interchange, and some reconciliation. So turned out not to be too bad. I would say, my, I mean, I'm very reluctant to criticize tactics because my own tactical judgment is pretty, pretty bad. I'm usually wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, things that I thought shouldn't have been done turned out very well. So take, say, Occupy. Uh, if anybody had asked me would it make sense to sit in Zuccotti Park uh, for a couple of weeks, I would have said, you're out of your mind. Uh, but it turned out very well. And the uh, uh, same is true many times. So tactical, ju tactical judgments are not trivial. You know, they're important. You have to consider what the likely consequences are, but it's a, it's a subtle judgment, and there's, I don't have much to say about it. I, I, in this particular case, I didn't think it turned out badly. It's interesting because, I mean, I did want to talk about Bernie Sanders, so it would be good to, to, to go to that. This, um, you know, there's this question that constantly comes up about, you know, race and the left, right? And that Sanders seemed particularly vulnerable to the criticism insofar as he identified as a democratic socialist and he had this, this uh, uh, political platform, this philosophy, this rhetoric that focused almost exclusively on the question of wealth inequality, uh, income inequality, and the kinds of power and leverage that the billionaire class and other elites have on disrupting the functioning of democratic government or the, the kinds of uh, political participation available to, to the citizenry. And what's remarkable is that, you know, in his mind, and he's correct on this, that any of the implications he ha he's, you know, of his programs would be, uh, you know, remarkably beneficial if you accept certain principles of the left for African Americans. But Many people don't see it that way. They don't, they don't respond necessarily to those kinds of ways of framing the argument. They don't respond to the, that method of putting uh, together a platform. And what was shocking to me is that it seemed that in a democratic primary, even an insurgent campaign looking to wield power over the eventual nominee, that the Sanders campaign hadn't really thought about how to recruit people of color to their campaign until very late. And I, I was curious as to, as to why you thought that would be the case. How could he miss something uh, that, that seems so glaringly obvious uh, to, well, to I, a scholar like me? Actually, I met uh, Bernie Sanders about 30 years ago and uh, spent some time with him. I respect him. I think he's doing very good things. But just take a look at his career. Uh, he was uh, a mayor of an, uh, in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, a representative in Vermont. Uh, uh, how much contact did he have with the problems of black people? And, in fact, I, th I think this sh there are other policies of his that, I mean, I like him, and I think he's having a very positive effect, but if you run through the policies, there's other policies I don't like, like, for example, his gun policies, which also reflect Vermont. Uh, uh, his a lot of his, the foreign policy issues, I don't agree with him about. Uh, but he's, uh, I think he's making a very positive contribution. He's doing something courageous, important. He's lit a spark. It's important effect. And I think the uh, pressure from the black community, including disruption of the speeches, did shift his campaign. It brought up issues that, yes, they would have continued to ignore. and. Uh, you can debate whether this is the best tactic or, you know, could discuss it. But uh, as I said before, I think the general impact was positive. Now, some people are trying to connect the surprising uh, success of his campaign so far. You know, he's out pulling Hillary Clinton in Iowa and uh, Vermont, and he's polling nationally much higher than almost anyone expected, certainly much higher than Martin O'Malley expected. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got a dig. I'm from Baltimore. Um, uh, but, but some people are describing the kinds of energies that are going into the Sanders campaign as part of a global phenomenon, 
right? So that we have Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, uh, another self-described socialist who's now uh, the head of the Labour Party in Britain, uh, and in Greece, which has been burdened so traumatically by austerity policy. Uh, we have uh, Alexis Tsipras of the left-wing Syriza Party, uh, who's been elected prime minister. And I was curious as to what you thought was the, you know, if something is shared behind these uh, these candidacies, if, if, if something uh, more universal is driving the kind of enthusiasm for the left in this moment. Um, Not just this moment. You know, there's something very common. It's called neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. This is a general assault on the world's population uh, that uh, takes different forms in different places, but is based on the same kinds of conceptions. Uh, and it's, uh, people have suffered everywhere. Every place that the neoliberal principles have been applied, it's been harmful to the general populations. Uh, in the United States, which is not harmed as much as others, you know, rich, powerful society, uh, there's been basically stagnation or decline for about 30 years for a majority of the population. I mean, people are now arguing about the minimum wage but if you take a look at the minimum wage, I presume you know this, through the huge growth period, 50s and 60s, uh, it tracked productivity. That started to break in the late 70s when the neoliberal assault began. Uh, if the minimum wage had continued to do so, it would now probably be about $20 an hour. So when people are talking about $15 an hour, they're saying, let's keep it low. Uh, and that holds for everything. Uh, 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 real male wages are now roughly what they were in the late 60s. Uh, the figures just came out a couple days ago about uh, median household incomes. Uh, they're now lower than they were uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, and it's been pretty flat uh, ever since, uh, you know, the Reagan, Thatcher, uh, uh, neoliberal, uh, uh, assault, and the same is true. It's uh, taking a different form in Europe, a uh, worse form in many ways. Uh, Greece, uh, Spain, uh, England have been uh, targeted by uh, uh, very reactionary economic policies, even worse than here. Uh, these, uh, the idea of austerity during recession, uh, even the IMF thinks it's ridiculous. And from an economic point of view, yes, yeah, sure, it's an absurdity, but that doesn't mean it's it's, it's foolish. It's a very good instrument of class war. It's uh, undermining uh, uh, social, it's undermining the major achievements of Europe since the Second World War, both political and social and economic. Uh, what we call you know, welfare state programs are being significantly undermined, uh, England as well. Uh, and. Uh, from the point of view of the people designing the policy, sure, they never liked these things, but let's get rid of them. And the same is happening almost everywhere. I mean, in England, it's, it's almost startling to see, for example, England. Uh, the National Health Service has its flaws, like everything. It's probably one of the best health systems in the world. They're now trying to make it like the American system, which is maybe the worst system in the world, uh, literally. Uh, about twice the per capita costs of other countries and some of the worst outcomes, uh, extensive bureaucracy and efficiency, uh, uh, enormous costs, uh, poor outcomes. So let's become like them and destroy a successful system. The same is happening in Canada. Uh, these are just different manifestations of the neoliberal programs. And the resistance is not just starting now. The major resistance started in Latin America about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the Lat Latin America was a very loyal student of the neoliberal doctrines and, of course, suffered significantly. But about 10 or 15 years ago, they started to pull out of it, uh, both economically and politically. Uh, in fact, uh, one of Obama's supposed foreign policy achievements is uh, the beginning of normalization of relations with Cuba. The way it's described here, uh, 
Obama made this forthcoming noble gesture to bring Cuba out of its isolation. It's exactly the opposite. The United States was utterly isolated in the hemisphere. Uh, the last major hemisphere conference happened to be in Colombia, the last US ally. Uh, the US is practically thrown out of the hemisphere on this issue and on the drug war, two major issues. Uh, they couldn't reach a consensus because the US and Canada wouldn't agree. The next uh, hemisphere conference was going to be in Panama this year. And if the United States had not made some move on Cuba, it probably would have been thrown out of the hemisphere. Uh, for anyone who knows the history of the United States and the Western Hemisphere, that's utterly shocking. Uh, this was the backyard when you didn't worry about it. Uh, they do what you tell them. If they don't, you overthrow the government. You know, uh, it's totally reversed. And this is a, this began as a reaction to the neoliberal policies, which uh, they have slowly begun to pull themselves out of. It's now spread to southern Europe. There are other uh, other manifestations here. So you're right. There's something global. It takes different forms in different places, but it's. Uh, has uh, commonalities as well. I think one of the things that's um, part and parcel of the neoliberal project, or the, at least the effect of the neoliberal project, <laughs> the dislocations uh, that have happened with people, uh, you know, we're seeing record uh, numbers of people seeking asylum, migrants at border conflicts. Uh, and so I, I, before I open up for questions, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, not, not simply those problems, but a kind of, I, I heard you backstage dismiss the description of populism, so I'd be curious as to what exactly you call it, but the nativist and uh, I think quite frankly racist in some respects uh, response to migration that we're seeing drive a lot of right wing politics in the West uh, at, our, at, at the moment that is also capturing the imagination of working class people in our country, of course, with Donald Trump uh, and Ben Carson, who just said to um, you know, a major media outlet that he thinks that there's no way anyone uh, who practices Islam should ever be the president. Uh, and he just thought that that was an okay thing to say. Um, uh, so I'm curious as to, as to how do you contextualize that uh, nativist, right wing, uh, if not populist, I'd be curious as to how you describe it, response. Well, there, uh, there are differences between the United States and Europe. You take a look at American history. It's a society of immigrants. Uh, the native indigenous population was destroyed. Pretty advanced civilizations destroyed, eliminated, people exterminated. You had to fill the continent with people, so you had immigrants. But the racism goes right back to the beginning. Uh, take, say, Benjamin Franklin, uh, you know, one of the most enlightened figures in the, in the world at the time, a leader of the Enlightenment. He had views on immigration. Uh, he thought that Germans and Swedes should be excluded because they're too swarthy, literally. Germans and Swedes. Uh, there's a myth of Anglo-Saxonism that goes right through American history, right into the 20th century. Uh, people are coming from all over the place, but they, when they work their way into the society, they become Anglo-Saxons. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, when he founded the University of Virginia, uh, that was to keep Southern gentlemen from being distorted by Harvard. You know? But one of the th it was a law school, and uh, they had to study Anglo-Saxon law, because that's our roots. You know, we're Anglo-Saxons. Uh, and uh, as it goes through, it takes, say, the Irish. When the Irish came to Boston, uh, they were uh, treated pretty much like blacks. Uh, you could see restaurants saying, you know, no dogs in Irish and that sort of thing. In fact, uh, some of it's really pretty hideous. If you take a look at the history of gynecology, a lot of it was developed at Harvard Medical School and they needed subjects. So who are the subjects? Well, you know, people who can be subjects, like uh, black women and Irish women. Uh, you can try out the techniques. Uh, 
find that sooner or later the Irish worked themselves into the society. They became you know, the policemen, the bureaucrats, the, the president, and so on and so forth. But, and then they become Anglo-Saxons, and you want to keep out the others. Uh, the United States needed immigrants right through the 19th century. And apart from uh, Oriental exclusion, which w was blocked, it was open until 1924. And at that point, the first major immigration law was aimed at Italians and Jews. Uh, and with that, you get nativism. We don't want any more. Uh, we have what we got. We don't want any more. Nobody else should have it. Uh, and if you take a look at the... And it's not that the immigrants want to come here. They would like to stay in their own countries. In fact, if you take the Middle East, the mass of, of refugees are staying right there. Um, there are countries that are absorbing huge numbers of refugees. I mean, in Lebanon, a small country, probably a quarter of the population are refugees. Uh, Iran has absorbed refugees. Uh, Jordan's absorbing them. Syria was absorbing them until it started to self-destruct. Uh, there are countries that absorb refugees. There are countries that generate refugees, like us. Uh, people are fleeing from Iraq. The Iraq war created maybe two million refugees, and they're still fleeing, they're fleeing from Afghanistan. So there are countries that absorb them. There are countries that generate them. There are countries that generate them and refuse to absorb them like us, for example. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, now we're magnanimously taking in, what, 5,000 Syrians or something. But uh, a lot of these are the result of kind of a sledgehammer hitting the region in the Iraq war, which uh, incited sectarian conflicts that are now tearing the whole region apart. Or take, say, south of the border, if you've looked at the statistics when there was a so-called refugee crisis, immigration crisis a year ago or so, the, the uh, largest number were coming from Honduras. Why Honduras? It's a poor country, but it was also hit by a, a sledgehammer. The government was overthrown, the democratic government, by a military coup. About the only country who supported it was the United States, indirectly, but supported it. And it turned into a monstrosity, and people are fleeing. As soon as we, first we create the situation in which they can't survive in their own country, then when they flee, uh, we put them into the, the, I don't know, it's pretty awful by the border. If they make it through the border and they don't get killed, they're stuck into trucks and uh, sent back as if it was a concentration camp and dumped across the border to, uh, uh, the, you know, to somehow take care of themselves if they can. And uh, now we build, you know, going to build a wall and so on. As, uh, the na but then you can understand the, 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 I mean, for people who are being uh, under duress and working people in the United States have had a pretty rotten time for 30 years or more, a generation. It's easy to try to find uh, a reason that isn't the true reason, but that's kind of on the surface, it seems to make intuitive sense. They're taking our jobs. In fact, they're not. They're taking jobs that nobody wants to take, and they increase the uh, uh, economic level of the places where they are. But that's subtle. What you see is they're working and I'm not. Uh, okay, must be their fault. And it's pretty easy for, uh, uh, you know, political figures, uh, races, demagogues, uh, the Trump types, to turn this into something that looks plausible. In Europe, it's even worse. I mean, I've always felt, all my life, in fact, that Europe is probably more racist than the United States. It doesn't show up as much in Europe because the societies tended to be homogeneous. So when everybody's blonde and blue-eyed, you can say, oh, we're not racist, you know, we love everybody. Uh, but as soon as you get a tiny percentage of the population uh, that deviates, uh, then all of a sudden uh, uh, it all comes out my, in extremely ugly ways. My personal experiences there have all been 
oh, uh, a level of intense interpersonal racism that I've never experienced in the United States. I do want to make sure we get a chance for questions. If everyone could line up at microphones, I know um, there are many, many questions. Remember, introduce yourself. Uh, please keep your questions short, and questions end with a question mark. All right, brother, you're first. Good evening, Professor Chomsky. Thank you for your distinguished visit to us. My name's Junius Williams. I'm a sophomore here at the college. You very compellingly and vividly recount the history of slavery and the legacies that it has on the African-American community in the United States. Would you then support a system of reparations, financial or otherwise, paid to the African-American community, and why or why not? Thank you. Would I very much, so. not just African-American, of uh, the uh, those who are, uh, you know, we ourselves didn't own slaves, but we, me, are rich and privileged because of the torture of black of blacks for centuries, and yes, we owe them reparations. Same with the remnants of the Native Americans. Same with countries that we've destroyed. Uh, take what about Iraq? I mean, we've devastated Iraq. Uh, it's uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, generated millions of refugees, uh, created a sectarian conflict that's destroying the place. Is it our responsibility? Sure. Whose responsibility is it? So yes, I think the call for reparations is very legitimate. Take, say, Europe and Africa. Uh, people are fleeing from Africa to Europe not the other way around. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, a couple of centuries of murderous, brutal colonialism. Uh, so sure, they owe reparations. Not just take in the refugees, uh, but do something about it. In fact, create conditions in their own societies in which there won't be refugees. That's the real answer to the so-called refugee problem, but it requires those who have uh, been uh, wielding the whip to say, okay, we benefited from it, it's our responsibility, we'll do something about it. A sister right here. Oh, okay, there we go. Hi, I'm Solange, I'm a sophomore at the college as well. Um, so my question kind of centers around this recent increase in more online progressivism, um, a lot of hashtag movements and social media campaigns, and I just wanted to know how you think this ties into intellectualism um, and progressivism, and if it contributes or takes away from the conversation. Yeah, I'm sorry, did, did, could you repeat? Yeah, so the question was, um, there's been a transformation in social media technologies, online technologies that have changed a lot of progressive activism and intellectual life. And do you think that these changes enable more profound conversation or in some ways limit it? Is that the social yep. media phenomenon? Yeah. yeah, social media, Twitter, um, those kind of digital publics. I think like most technology, it's kind of neutral, depends how you use it. Uh, so it can, I mean, social media are in fact used for organization, organizing activities. Uh, that's good. On the other hand, I don't know about you, but when I walk around campus and see everybody holding an iPhone and having a superficial conversation with somebody in India or whatever it is, I, I don't think it's a good thing. I think there's a... It, it can, it's a very atomized society. That's one of its real problems. Uh, and in fact, the neoliberalism tends to create atomization. In fact, that's part of the basic ideology. You're in it for yourself. Uh, other people can fend for themselves, but I'm for me. That's so-called market ideology. And the social media have a tendency to magnify that. They don't have to, but they do, I think. So it's, uh, as I say, like most technology, you can use it uh, in a constructive, uh, effective way, or it can be used to uh, uh, diminish the character of life. It's your choice. And you can quote, tweet it with the hashtag Chomsky night <laughs> at the Kennedy School. <laughs> uh, right up here, a sister right here. Hi, my name is Nancy, and I'm a junior joint concentrating in history and Jewish studies. Uh, there's a term amongst the very small milieu of uh, 
very liberal Jews called PEP, which is progressive except for Palestine. Um, this refers to a special relationship that we have to admit exists between America and Israel that we can trace at least, but probably farther, at least back to 1967, at which point the American Jewish community played a huge role in the civil rights movement, um, but then began to have some tensions and, tensions and disagreements when the black American community and the Jewish American community disagreed over um, the Six Day War uh, in 67. Um, and we can kind of follow that up to today when we have figures like Sheldon Adelson, who will determine our Republican candidate in the primary, um, also donating $40 million to endeavors such as birthright, ironically okay, we gotta called. Get to and the so question my question too, is, though. sorry, my question <laughs> is, um, will progress in the progressive American community require a reckoning um, with a right, a, a, an Israel that is becoming more right wing, um, or is that an issue that we can somehow excise from the issue of domestic uh, progressive politics? Yeah, did, did you? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So the, the, the question, the question part was, uh, how should progressivism uh, deal with uh, an increasingly right wing Israel? Um, is this, an, is this an issue that will inevitably cause challenges for the solidarities needed to forge an American progressivism? Or is there some way for American progressives to kind of sidestep that question and achieve other aims? Well, in my, I mean, I've been involved in this all my life since the 1930s, so it's a big issue for me. But uh, what has happened, if, if you take a look at what's uh, happening with Israel and Israel in the world, it's pretty dramatic. If you go back, say, 40 years, uh, Israel was one of the most admired countries in the world. Uh, today, it's uh, one of the most disliked, uh, feared, uh, hated countries in the world. And what's happened? What's happened was perfectly predictable. I don't say that in retrospect. I was writing about it in the early 70s completely predictable. Uh, Israel, after the 67 war, which you mentioned, uh, was uh, in a position where it could take several choices. One, and the choices were stark and clear. In 1971, uh, Egypt, the major country in the region, the only military force outside of Israel, Egypt offered Israel a full peace treaty full peace treaty, no problems, with one condition, withdraw from Egyptian territory. Actually, they said Palestinian territory, but they meant uh, Arab territory, but they meant Egyptian territory, the Sinai. Now, that was considered by the Israeli cabinet. They rejected it. Uh, they wanted to expand into the Sinai. And ever since then, Israel has been facing a choice between expansion or security, and it's selected expansion. That's happening right to the moment. And we're responsible in, a, in large measure for that. It's largely because of the unique unilateral US rejectionism that this continues. The US is standing virtually alone and has for years in preventing a diplomatic settlement. It's happening right almost to the present. Uh, the la the, a lot of it is vetoes of Security Council resolutions. It's not all. The most recent one was by President Obama, who went so far as to veto a resolution calling for official US policy. Official US policy is there should be no settlement expansion. Actually, that's a pretty small issue. The issue is the settlements, not their expansion. But the, uh, the official policy is they shouldn't expand. That was the UN resolution. Obama vetoed it. In fact, there was a much more significant case just a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. Uh, the, every five years, there's a review uh, a conference of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. That's the most important arms treaty in the world. If that breaks down, we can kiss each other goodbye. It's putting some break, not a, enough of a break, but some break on the development of means of destruction which will obliterate us very quickly. 
uh, the non-proliferation treaty is actually conditioned on an agreement 20 years ago that uh, there be steps towards establishing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. It was because of formal acceptance of that condition that the non-proliferation treaty was able to be extended. Comes up every five years at the review conference. The U.S. blocks it. Obama just did a couple of months ago, the last meeting. And of course, it's always the same reason to protect Israel's nuclear weapons. So this U.S. rejectionism is not only maintaining severe instability in the region, and in my view is harming Israel severely, uh, but it's also may break down the non-proliferation treaty and open the way to uh, uh, a further expansion of this you know, curse that will destroy us. It's kind of ironic in the context of all the flurry about Iranian nuclear programs. Iran is in the lead in trying to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone. They're calling for it constantly. Uh, their foreign minister just repeated it again. He said, okay, we made this uh, nuclear deal, now let's go on and, and, bring a, and uh, take a real step forward. Make this one of the regions free of nuclear weapons. In fact, all weapons of mass destruction. The U.S. blocked it. And uh, the uh, media cooperated by not even, barely even reporting it, practically not at all. Well, these are things that are happening all the time. We have a significant share of responsibility, all of us. We can influence policy. It's, it'll go on like this unless we do. Uh, and for Israel, uh, it's having exactly the consequences you described. It's becoming uh, very right-wing, very racist, very oppressive, all predictable from the choice 40 years ago to choose expansion over uh, security. Uh, I think we're basically out of time, we, but we can do one more right here. Hi, uh, my name is Taha. I'm a Syrian physician affiliated with HMS, and I'm sorry I'm holding an iPhone. Um, <laughs> I have a twofold question uh, related to Syria. So first, uh, would you uh, describe the recent Russian deployment in Syria as imperialistic? And uh, well, how do you explain the lift, uh, whether in the US or Europe, not standing against, uh, against that kind of behavior? And the second question is, it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you are against uh, the US launching airstrikes against Bashar Assad after the chemical weapon attack in 2013. Do you think the West has uh, a moral responsibility in any scenario to actually use force to stop mass scale murder uh, perpetrated by uh, like dicta dictator, the, uh, dictatorships anywhere in the world. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't hear very well. Yeah. So uh, there were two questions. One is, should we understand uh, the Russian intervention in Syria as an act of imperialism? And the second is um, referencing a uh, critique you made of, um, of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. intervention, or, or, or the possibility of U.S. intervention in Syria with the use of chemical weapons, and the question is: Is there un, is there any condition in which you would justify uh, U.S. humanitarian intervention to prevent mass slaughter or chemical weapons deployment? Is that fair? Yeah. Thanks. Not just U.S. Uh, you can ask the question. Uh, when is humanitarian intervention justified? And there's a prior question. Does the category exist? Is there such a thing as humanitarian intervention? Actually, that's not an idle question. If you look over modern history, what you discover is just about every use of force is called humanitarian intervention. Uh, uh, literally, uh, we're doing it for noble purposes. But then you always have to ask the question, is it true? And the answer to that is almost always no. Uh, I wouldn't say 100%, but overwhelmingly, intervention is for the purposes, uh, for the interests of those who are carrying out the force. So is it, uh, would it be uh, a legitimate thing? Uh, yeah, it would, if it existed. 
but the question is, does it exist? So take, say, Libya. That was called humanitarian intervention. Uh, the US, Britain, and France uh, decided to violate the Security Council resolution that they had uh, rammed through uh, and became the air force of the rebels and ended up destroying the country. It's a horror story. It's, in fact, one of the things that's contributing to the atrocities in Libya as arms and jihadis and so on are flowing out through there. All right, so let's take US policy in Syria uh, or, uh, or Russian policy. Uh, Russia is supporting a brutal, vicious government. You can, I don't think they should, but it's not imperialism. To support a government is not imperialism. Maybe completely wrong, but it's not imperialism. What's the US doing? The U.S. is supporting the countries that are developing the jihadi movement. The main source of the uh, Islam, radical Islamist movements is Saudi Arabia, our main ally, uh, not only with funding, uh, but also with uh, the messianic zeal with which they use their oil resources to promulgate uh, radical the most extreme version of radical fundamentalist Islam. So, and uh, uh, Patrick Coburn, one of the main, most serious commentators on the region, I think correctly, describes the, what he calls the Wahhabization of Sunni Islam coming from Saudi Arabia primarily as one of the most dangerous developments of the era. The one offshoot of it is uh, the so-called Islamic State. Uh, but if you look at, say, the al-Nusra Front, which is the al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, jihadi force in Syria, it's about the same. They're fighting a turf battle, but their uh, ideology and goals are very similar. Who's supporting the al-Nusra Front? Our ally, Turkey. Our NATO ally, Turkey, are the main supporters of the al-Nusra Front. In fact, that support is so strong that you recall a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Pentagon sent in a group of what are called moderate fighters, around 50 people who they had trained for years at the cost of uh, you know, half a billion dollars. Uh, within a few days, they were either killed, captured, or defected uh, uh, to the al-Nusra front, apparently with the aid of Turkish intelligence. So our main ally, Saudi Arabia, it has been the source of what became the Islamic State. Uh, our other main ally, Turkey, is supporting a comparable group, the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Nusra Front. Uh, Russia is supporting Assad, also comparably brutal and destructive. How do you intervene? Can you think of some? No, I don't think you should ignore it. Uh, you can't. The idea that military intervention would help it is very dubious. I don't think anyone who's really familiar with Syria, at least no one I know of, has been in favor of military intervention. Because, no, who knows about Syria? Well, exactly who would you attack? If you attack Assad, you're undermining the resistance to the Islamic State and al-Nusra, who will then take over. Is that what you want for Syria? No. They, they didn't exist in 2013 at the chemical weapon. Uh, the sources existed. The roots, yeah, but if you go back to 2012, there was no uprising. So sure, by 2013, the beginnings were starting. But everybody who was watching it could see these groups develop. They're pouring in from the outside. They have roots in the Sunni community. Uh, which sees itself as under attack. And you, if you could find you know, the so-called moderate forces, if you could find them, I mean, they're nice people. I met many of them in Lebanon at the time, and I'd be happy if they could take over, but it just doesn't look like a possibility. When a military conflict, when a forceful conflict develops, there's a dynamic that's almost universal the most brutal elements move to the front. The ones who are really vicious, brutal, and murderous, they take over, everybody else put to the side. It happens over and over. 
as soon as the conflict in Syria was militarized, you could see it beginning. It would be nice if things worked out differently, but they don't. And you're now in a situation where you have a group of forces, all of whom are totally unpalatable, some of them being supported by the Russians, some of them being supported by the US allies, main US allies, and, the, and just what form military intervention could take in these circumstances is nobody, to my mind, has given a possible scenario that makes any sense. There is something that could be done, one thing, slim possibility, but it's the only hope. And that's the kind of uh, settlement that, say, Lakhdar Brahimi was trying to uh, negotiate, uh, some kind of negotiated settlement. It would have to involve a transitional government, and like it or not, the Assad regime will have to be part of it. If the Assad regime is not permitted to be part of it, they'll fight to the death, certainly. They're not going to say, OK, we commit suicide. So awful as they are, they're going to have to be part of it, uh, just as uh, the leaders of the apartheid regime in South Africa had to be part of a settlement. Uh, the United States and its allies have refused to allow it to be part of the settlement. That guarantees that there'll be no negotiations. Uh, the, Russian, the, uh, the Russian position has been they must be part of the settlement, and it may even that they must stay. Well, if that happens, it's not going to be a, there's not going to be a negotiated settlement. There was actually, you've probably read, if you read the European press, you will know that a couple of days ago, uh, maybe a week ago, there were uh, the Finnish ambassador who was highly, uh, who was basically running the negotiations, had an interview in which he claimed that uh, in 2012, the Russians had offered uh, to have a uh, negotiated settlement in which Assad would step down. Yeah, I think that was refuted. Well, that's what he said. Uh, that's reported by all the press in England, by the European press, has yet to be reported in the print press in the United States. There are a few online reports which sort of dismiss it and say it wasn't serious. We don't know whether it was serious or not. The only way to find out whether a proposal is serious is to pursue it, and apparently it was dismissed. So maybe it was serious, maybe it wasn't. Uh, but if there's any alternative to that, I don't know what it is. Well, I want to thank Professor Chomsky for his erudition and his insight on all of these issues. I hope that we continue these conversations about identity, power, and the left. I want to thank the Harvard Black Men's Forum, the Harvard Association of Black Women uh, for all of their support in bringing this together, and the Institute of Politics for hosting us this evening. And I'd like everybody to give another round of applause for <laughs> Professor Chomsky. Thank you so much.